Welcome, everybody. My name's Laura. I'm the program coordinator here at the Salt Marsh. I'd like to welcome Elder Law Attorney. What's your name? Arthur, Arthur Bergeron. Bergeron. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Kills me. I'm kidding. She kills How many me. times right. have you been here now? A lot. A lot. A lot. Arthur Bergeron is going to talk about trusts today. Do you need them? Do you not need them? And what in the world are they exactly? Exactly. Why did your neighbor tell you you have to have one? Very true. Right? All righty. So everybody enjoy. Questions at the end, right? Questions at the end. All righty. Okay. So um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I remember when I was, this is a program I, haven't, I hadn't done before, so you have to excuse me if it's a little goofy because I haven't done it. Um, but I was talking to a person at another senior center, because I'm doing this, I do this in several, and uh, she said, oh, no one's going to come to that. That doesn't sound really that interesting. I said, trust me. Someone's <laughs> going to come to this one. Right? So we're going to talk about trust today. Um, and we're going to talk about Trust as a solution to a problem. So um, this, this the, and by the way, first I'm just going to shut off my phone because the last time I was here, it rang while I was talking. Okay. Um, so, so I'm an my, oh, for those of you who haven't been here before. My name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. I'm at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us: 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro, Mass. And all the other 59 do something else, and I do this. Right? Every, what I like about being there is that I don't have to do anything else because I really like doing this. And this, elder law, is really trying to deal with all of the issues that you might have if you're, say, over 65 and probably thinking about retiring, probably your income isn't growing anymore, it's shrinking, and you've got a set of goals. How to make, you know, you've now realized you're old enough, you realize you're going to die at some point, you know, so you want to kind of figure out between now and then how things are going to go. And, and who's going to get what after you die? So those are kind of standard elder law questions. Uh, my average, and these are the folks I see, my average, my median client age is 74. So I see mostly, I like it because they all think I'm young. This is terrific, right? <laughs> so um, when folks come in, they are typically, and by the way, the people that I talk to are a lot like my friends Frank and Mary. If you've been here before, you've seen Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And, they, and, and their goal, you know, and they've, their basic goal is they want to stay in their house, they want to take care of each other, and when they die, they want their kids to get whatever is left over. So, and, and, and they may be coming to me all at, at different ages or with different situations, but that's basically what we're talking about, right? So the question is, is do they need it? And typically they'll come in and, they'll, and one of them will t inevitably say, you know, I, I think I need a trust. And I'll say, oh, why do you think you need a trust? Well, my neighbor has one. And she said that I should get one. Or my daughter called me and said, you know, Ma, you really need a trust. You know? So and the point of what a trust is, there, are, there isn't just one kind. There are a whole bunch of different kinds. And they are meant to solve problems now and to help you sleep at night. My basic goal, I always help people as an elder law attorney, is to help people sleep at night. Once you get to our age, um, you know, fame and fortune, well, you know, maybe. But really, the goal is to sleep well at night. Right? And so the question is, what is it that helps you sleep at night? Or conversely, what is it that keeps you up at night? Right? And that changes over time. It changes depending on what your income is and what your assets are. And in some of those situations, what keeps you up at night might get solved through a trust. So we're going to talk about those. Um, but first, I'm just going to do a couple of, of kind of definitions. So everybody here, raise your hand if you've heard the term irrevocable trust. Well, look at that. What a surprise. So, and, and, and most of you have heard that term in relation to mass health related planning in nursing homes. Um, so there are revocable trusts, and we're going to talk about those later. But first, let me just talk about what they are. So there are revocable trusts, and there are irrevocable trusts. What does that mean? If I want to give one of my kids something, right, I have two ways of doing that. I can just give it to them. Right? I can just hand it to them, and if they accept it, then that's a valid gift, and they get to keep it. Right? And, I, and, if I, and, and I can't get it back. And once I've given to them, it to them, once I've had donative intent, the intent to give, and I've given somebody something, whether it's a dollar bill or a house, and they've accepted it, legally, I can't get it back anymore. It's theirs. Right? So I can do that. I can give away anything that I want. Alternatively, if I don't want to necessarily hand it over that way, uh, either because um, I am concerned about how they're going to handle it 
or because I'm concerned that their creditors might get it, or their, their spouse that I don't like might get it, you know, or any number of things, or if I just want to put it someplace where I know it's going to be theirs, but I still have the ability to get it back, well, I can, I can create a trust. I can name a trustee of that trust. The, a trustee is the legal owner of the property that I put into the trust, but he's holding it not for the benefit of himself or herself, but for the benefit of other people called beneficiaries. And the thing about that trust is unless the, and, and I can describe when I give it to that person, in, in, typically in writing, although it doesn't have to be in writing, but it's much better in writing. Uh, I can describe in that writing the way in which that trustee is going to deal with that property for the benefit of those beneficiaries. But unless it, the document specifically says it is an irrevocable trust, when I give the, put the stuff in the trust, I can still take it back at any time. I can still notify the trustee, I want that stuff back, or some of it, I want that house back, or the money, or whatever. That is an, a, a revocable trust. I can revoke it, I can take it back. Now, many of you have heard that one of the reasons why you want an irrevocable, and by the way, irrevocable and irrevocable, there is no correct pronunciation. <laughs> Lawyers argue about this all the time, we actually looked it up one day, right? And in the dictionary, you can do it either way, right? So, most people say, well, I've got an irrevocable trust, and, and, the, and as a result of that, the assets that are in there are safe for mass health purposes they, that, because they're not going to get counted if I go to the nursing home. Well, um, that's not the case. That is not the case, right? Um, uh, it, it, in order for that to be the case, the trust has to be not only irrevocable, but it has to be unamendable, unamendable. So I can have a trust that is irrevocable, but if the rules that are in the trust say that I still have the ability to amend the trust, right, by changing the names of the beneficiaries, for example, or giving the money to myself, or by changing the way the things are distributed, well, then I still have enough control of those assets, even though I have irrevocably put the things in the trust, that for mass health purposes, they still count, right? So there are irrevocable versus revocable trusts. There are amendable versus non-amendable trusts, right? And we're going to give you some examples of that as we go through. Then there's one other kind of important distinction, um, and that is between testamentary trusts and inter vivos trusts. A testamentary trust is a trust that is part of your will. So in your will, you say, and of course your will is always irrevocable because it only kicks in when you're dead. So by the, you know, when, if the things are going through your will, by that point, the rules can't be changed, right? So it's always irrevocable. Um, and, the, and, and, and that's a testamentary trust, a trust in which instead of saying, for example, I'm giving my property to Peter, Paul, and Mary, or I'm giving my property to my wife because she's still alive, you say, I'm giving that my property to a trustee for the benefit of my wife. And we're going to have the rules, and it's all going to be in the will. But the point is, that is a testamentary trust. Everything that is not a testamentary trust is an inter vivos trust. Inter vivos means between people, between living people. Um, and so that's a distinction we're going to hear a little bit more about later on. But those are just kind of things that are important. So now we're going to start talking about some examples. Now you've heard this, me say this before. Frank and Mary's goal in life is very simple. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Their estate plan is very simple. One of them dies. They want to leave everything to their spouse. The spouse is dead. They want to leave everything to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They want to divide things up. They may have a provision in there that says because they don't especially... You know, one of them is maybe having marital problems, so they'll say regarding that child, we're going to hold that money in a testamentary trust for the benefit of that child so that the spouse that they don't like can't get to it, right? Or if there are creditor issues, we can do the same kind of things. But the bottom line is, that's how the system works. We're going to give everything to the spouse, and then we're going to divide things up among the kids. Now, implied in that are some people that they don't want to have as the beneficiaries. The Department of Revenue. I've never had a will. Oh, I really want to leave $100,000 to the IRS. <laughs> They've done such a great job for me. You know, I just want to leave them some money. Or the nursing home. It's, you know, occasionally, I've heard people say, you know, I want to provide a, uh, something for the nursing home, but not often, right? Uh, or Mass Health. Mass Health, a government agency. I very seldom hear that either. So one of the goals of your estate planning is to make sure, and your lifetime planning, is to make sure that your assets don't inadvertently go to the people that you don't want them to go to. And that's part of our job as elder law attorneys is to try to figure that out, okay? So here's Frank and Mary. They obviously um, live in a really small house in Nantucket because it's only worth $300,000. Frank has an IRA, but, but I needed to use these numbers 
for, for reasons that will become clear. Um, Frank has an IRA worth 150. Mary is named as the beneficiary. Frank owns an annuity. Uh, and, and Mary is named as the beneficiary. That's one of the funny things about annuities. You would think that the person who's getting the money from the annuity would be called the beneficiary, but they're not usually, right? They're called the annuitant, right? So if I buy an annuity and the, with the insurance company is going to be paying me, I'm the annuitant, the person that gets it when I die is typically called the beneficiary. And they've got a joint savings account, right? $250,000. So their total assets are $800,000. And they're 65. And the reason why that's important for this example is that. So when people come in to me and talk to me and they're 65, they are not nearly as worried about Alzheimer's and dementia and nursing homes as when they come in and they're 85, right? Because if you're 65, your chances of getting Alzheimer's, which is the kind of the leading cause of dementia, uh, are one in nine. When you're 85, they're one in three. By the time you're 85, people, the reason for that, of course, is that people by the time you're 85 are already dead. If they were going to die of something else, you know, cancer, various things have already killed them. So kind of the people who are left are the people who are going to be probably getting dementia. So in this case, at age 65, they're not especially worried about nursing home issues, and therefore they're not trying to structure their assets accordingly. Um, um, they're, they're, people will often say, I don't want to pay a dime to the government, you know, and I can, I can, I can buy into that. Um, well, obviously, as long as somebody's paying, I mean, that's what Donald Trump has always said, you know, and where are we? So, but, but, he, but, the, but the main thing is, if, if, if you're worried about paying it through the estate tax, the federal estate tax is never going to touch you. Well, not never, right? The federal estate tax, the minimum su subject to estate taxation is over $5.4 million now. And if you die and your spouse is alive and you haven't used that exemption, your spouse gets it. So when your spouse dies, their exemption is $10.8 million, right? So that applies to some people, but not a lot, right? The Massachusetts estate tax, however, starts taxing you when the assets are more than a million dollars. So you may have a concern about estate taxation if you've got assets of more than a million dollars. In this case, Mary and Frank don't, so they're not really worried about that. So why then, what would they be worried about? Typically that. They're saying, and this applies to younger people, and to still to people, typically if they're 65, they're saying, well, we want to avoid the probate process. What is that exactly? So probate, the purpose of the probate process is to make sure that if you die owning something, we can figure out, we meaning the rest of the world, who owns it then, right? So if you die owning something in your individual name, then the probate process is designed, among other things, to, make sh to figure out who owns it. Now, there are two possibilities in that case. Either you have a will or you don't regarding probate property. If you have a will, then the probate court's job is to make sure that the people who are named in the will get it in the shares in which you've named them, ex with a very few uh, exceptions, which we won't go through. Um, if you have no will, um, then the probate court is going to simply apply the will that has written, been written for you, which is, which is the, called the rules of intestacy. There are a set of rules regarding what happens to the property of a dead person uh, if they have no will, right? And among other things, in the case that we've been using, uh, if Frank's goal is to leave everything to Mary, and the, the, both of their goals is then to leave everything to the kids, that's exactly what happens if you have no will. So it may be that for Frank and Mary, they don't even need a will because the exact same thing is going to happen. Now, often people will say to me, oh, but I have a will so that I can avoid probate. Oh, no. Oh, no. If you die owning something in your individual name, right, you're going through probate. The only question is who gets the stuff at the end. If you have a will, it's one set of rules. Otherwise, it's this standard other set of rules. Okay? So um, they may have an interest in avoiding the probate process. So let's go back to this example. So that's what, what Frank and Mary own. Right? And that's how they own it. They have their house jointly, their savings jointly. Uh, Frank has that IRA. She, he's named Mary as the death beneficiary, and Frank has the annuity. Um, if Frank dies, do we need, does, is, does there need to be a probate here of Frank's assets? Raise your hand if you think there needs to be a probate. Raise your hand if you think there doesn't need to be a probate. You folks win. There doesn't need to be one because Frank doesn't own his house individually. He owns it jointly with his wife. And what that means legally is that each of them owns 100% of that property. If one of them dies, their interest simply evaporates, leaving the other one as the sole owner of the property. And so there's no probate necessary because we know who owns it. 
Same thing with the savings account. Frank's IRA isn't really owned by him. He thinks he, you know, he gets these financial statements and he thinks it's his money, but it always says at the top, custodian for, right? So the institution that's holding the money is actually the owner of that money. They just are required to give it to you in certain cases. And then you, if you've been good, you've filled out a death beneficiary form that says where that goes when you die, and therefore it doesn't go through probate. Similarly with annuities, I have never seen an annuity that doesn't have a, a, a pay on death or a death beneficiary provision in it. So if Frank dies, there's not going to be a probate. If, um, if Mary dies, though, there may be. We're going to talk about that in a second. So the reasons to avoid probate. The reasons to avoid probate. There are two. One, it takes time from the time you die until the assets that you have can be distributed, right? Whether distributed through your will or through these rules of intestacy. The reason for that is that when you die, the probate courts, one of their jobs is to make sure the right people get the money. The, their other job, though, an important one, is to make sure that the creditors get paid. So no, nobody, none of the kids can get any of the money or the assets that are going through probate until the creditors have been paid. How can you tell if they've been paid? They have one year from the date of your death to file a claim in the probate court. Now, from the perspective of most of the world, that's called a short statute of limitations, right? So if I were to run over you today, if I hit you with my, with my car, I ran over you with my car, and you got injured, uh, and, and I lived, you would have three years to sue me. That's the statute of limitations. After that, you no longer have the right to sue me. If I ran over you and then hit a stone wall and died, however, you would only have one year to sue my estate, right? So it's a short statute of limitations from your perspective, <laughs> but from my kids' perspectives, because they want the assets, that's a very long statute of limitations. It means they have to wait around for a year to see if you or anybody else shows up and files a claim. So if you can avoid probate, you can avoid waiting around that year. The other reason you want to avoid it is just the cost of it. The, the, you, know, the, the, you can try going through the probate process without using a lawyer, but it ain't pretty. I mean, there are, the forms are complicated, and you've got to deal with the courthouse, and they're all grumpy, and they're understaffed, you know. Um, I, I shouldn't say that. This is Nantucket. That may not be the case. I do a lot of work in Middlesex County where that is definitely the case. So, so, but in any event, it's going to cost you some money. So if, if you want, if you're trying to avoid that, remember, if Frank died, there wasn't going to be a probate. If Mary, though, then owned all of those assets, right? Remember, the house is no longer owned jointly at that point. Mary owns it individually. The savings are now owned individually. So unless something has been done, those assets are going to go through probate if she dies. So the question is, can she avoid that? Well, there are several ways to do it. One um, is through these death beneficiary designations. Um, even regarding her bank accounts, it may be that she can name a person, talk to the bank about it. Um, some banks will allow you to name just one person as a beneficiary. They're called, called so-called um, trustee accounts, uh, totten, totten accounts. Um, some will allow you to name more than one beneficiary. There is some question as far as the bank regulations are concerned as to whether that's allowed. Um, but if, they can, if you can, well, then that may be the way for Mary to avoid that problem. Or she could own the accounts jointly with her kids, or she could own the house jointly with her kids. She could transfer the house uh, to all of her kids and herself jointly. The legal effect is if she dies, her interest evaporates. The remaining kids own the property, right? Similarly with the bank account. And that is the cheapest way to avoid probate, the cheapest way. Um, there are some problems with that, however, right? So if all of the kids are on the bank account with you jointly, they each own 100% of the account, right? So any one of them can go to the bank and take the money at any time. And if they have a creditor, that creditor can sue and attach all of the account because they own 100% of the account. And it makes no difference that you do too, right? So there may be some reasons why you don't want to use that. Another option is this life estate. This is the one I bet many of you have heard of that, right? Many of you have heard of the notion of taking your real estate and transferring the property to your kids but keeping a life estate in the property. What does that mean? It means that you have all of the rights of an owner until you die. You have the right to throw anybody out that, you know, kids can't throw you out. You got the house, right? You have the responsibility to pay all the bills and the insurance and the taxes and stuff. But the moment that you die, your interest evaporates if you have transferred the property to the children but kept a life estate. Instead, they get the remainder. That's why the interest they get is called a remainder interest. They're actually called remainder men, and, and that's the legal term, remainder men. 
So, and that may be a way to, that is the least expensive way. Similarly with the joint, it's about the same cost because it's just the cost of recording a deed uh, at the registry of deed, preparing and recording the deed. Now, there are a couple of problems with that, uh, with doing it that way. Uh, if, if you're trying to protect this property, one is that, and the same is true with the joint ownership, once, if you die and now your kids own the property and they have to figure out what to do with that property, like sell it or rent it or whatever, they all have to agree. It's got to be 100% agreement, right? Everybody gets a veto, right? Then there are the problems, well, I'll give you, I'll give you two problems that are, that are well, these, these are both problems that have occurred, occurred on the other island, on the other island. So I had one lady who called me, and she had one son, and she'd been living on, in Vineyard Haven forever, and so she had many years before transferred a remainder interest to her child, kept a life estate in her house, which is a very nice house, and, 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 but she called me and I went over the house and she said, I just wanna check and see if I have a problem. My son called me and he got served with divorce papers. I said, oh, you've got a problem. You've really got a problem because she was in her 80s, so for purposes of figuring out how much of the value of the house was hers and how much was her son's as the owner of the remainder, the older you get, the smaller the value attributable to the life estate, which makes sense because it's gonna go away sh soon, right? And in her age, her life estate was worth about 15% of the value and the house and, and the remainder interest was worth 85% of the value of an $800,000 house. So it wasn't a huge house, it was in Martha's Vineyard, you know. So imagine what that is here. And, and, and that remainder interest was in play, right? That was gonna be part of the divorce because that's owned by the son, right? Second case, wonderful couple from, from uh, grew up in Boston, they were from uh, Roxbury. Uh, Afro-American couple had moved from Roxbury to, or had gotten a summer place in Oak Bluffs. Very large Afro-American population, you know, historically, it was the place where a lot of, a lot of entertainers came from New York, and, you know, uh, uh, Afro-American entertainers. Great place, big community. So they had bought this wonderful house, two blocks from the beach in Oak Bluffs. Had it for years, so now they're in their 80s. Uh, and, and, you know, they got an okay income, but they don't have a lot in savings, but they want to go back home. Their grandchildren are still closer to Boston, Dorchester, you know, Roxbury, West Roxbury. Um, but in order to do that, they need to try to sell their house, but I'm not gonna buy their house, I'm not just gonna buy their life estate if I'm gonna buy their house, I wanna buy the whole house, right? So they need to get their kids to retransfer their remainder interest back to them so that they can turn around and sell the house. And two of the three children will do it, <laughs> but the other one won't. And so they called me and said, what can we do? And I said, nothing, there is nothing you can do. There is nothing you can do. That child doesn't have to give you back that remainder interest. I said, you can go to court and you can get a petition to partition the, the real estate, which means the court's gonna order, order a sale of the real estate. But all you're gonna be entitled to from that sale is the life estate value. Remember, like 15% of the value of the house, right? And they said, well, what about a reverse mortgage? Can I get a reverse mortgage? Because that way, because they were kind of out of cash, so they just needed some money. Uh, and I said, yeah, but everybody's gotta sign the reverse mortgage, you know? So is that son gonna sign the reverse mortgage? No. Right, so they've got a problem. So um, for that, for those folks who who find problems with these alternatives, the alternative is really a trust, and it is a revocable and amendable trust. Typically, what we would advise in this case is we say to Mary, create a trust, name yourself as the trustee for the benefit of yourself and your children, uh, make it revocable so you can take back the property anytime if you want. Make it amendable so that if you get into disagreements with your kids or whatever, you can always change the rules. Um, but you say right in the trust that if you die, that you name one or more of the, of the kids as successor trustees and you tell the trustee at that, you know, take the property, sell it and divide up the proceeds, right? Now, at the moment that Mary dies, this becomes irrevocable, right? Because she's dead, so she can't revoke it anymore and it becomes unamendable. You put that right into the trust. You'd say she has the power to, 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 to change the rules, but the later trustees don't, right? And that will allow Mary to avoid the probate process, okay? It was, and, and many people will do this even when both spouses are alive, just because they want to take care of it, but more often when one spouse has died, because people realize that, in, like in this case, when one spouse dies, there is no probate, so you, they don't care about doing this to avoid probate until you've got a single person, okay? So now we're gonna go back and take Frank and Mary. Um, and they're the same age, they're 65, so they're still not worried about nursing homes, but look, their assets went up, right? 
So it, it, their house is still only worth 400,000, but they've got some cash now worth 550. Their total value of their assets is a million two. So now they're over that million dollar threshold, that one million dollar Mass Massachusetts estate tax threshold. As a result of which, um, if Frank dies first and leaves everything to Mary, because remember that's the plan right now, um, there will be no estate tax because there's a 100% marital deduction. But if Mary becomes the sole owner of the assets and then she dies and she has a million two in assets, remember Frank died and there was a 100% marital deduction. But if Mary's got those assets and she dies, there will be a tax of $49,040. Now that is not a huge tax, right? Um, but remember, if, it, if his estate had been a million, it would have been zero. So the cost of being over by $200,000 is $49,000, effectively a 25% um, effective estate tax. The, 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 by the way, the estate tax on the first dollar over a million is 40%, right? And it stays at 40% until you get to about $1,120,000, and then for reasons that I won't go through, it drops to like 6.6%. So this is especially important and saves a lot of money marginally for folks who are pretty close to a million, between a million and a million and a million five. So the question is, can you avoid that? Um, and the answer is yes. The way you do that, once again, those are the assets. And if you're trying to do estate tax avoidance, then what you want to do to understand this, you need to understand what we've talked about before, that, that everybody, in addition to having the ability to give their spouse unlimited assets, has the ability to give anybody else up to a million dollars before there's any tax that gets, estate tax that gets charged. So effectively, what Frank did when he died and left everything to Mary was he threw away his ability to give the kids up to a million dollars tax-free, right? Because, because when they were both alive, they could each have given the kids a million dollars tax-free, but he's dead now, so only she can. So the question is, is there a way that we can, we can preserve this, this tax benefit that Frank had? And the answer is yes. And that's why, and, and that's, I'm going to call this a tax avoidance trust. Oftentimes you'll hear this referred to as a credit shelter trust. Uh, or I've heard it called a million different things because lawyers love making up names for this stuff. You know? so, but, the, I, but what has to be in there, right, is what Frank can do is say, as to some assets that he owns, and he can own them individually, in which case these rules are going to get applied through his will, through a testamentary trust, or he can put them into a trust right now. He can say that he's now the trustee of this trust, which is revocable and amendable until he dies, but following his death becomes irrevocable and unamendable, right? He can do it either way. But what he needs to do is he has to, he has to put some rules into this trust, and these are the rules. Can't have more than a million dollars in it. Because remember, he can only give away, if, if he wants to keep it from being taxed, because he can only give away a million dollars to these other people. Um, the beneficiaries can be anybody he wants, but it can be his spouse and his children. And that's who he wanted, remember? He wants his spouse first and then his kids. Um, no early distributions to her, his kids are required. He can say right in the trust that the trustee never has to give anything to those other kids until Mary has died. And finally, Mary can be the trustee. Mary can be in charge of all this money and decide whether she's going to give it to herself or whether she's going to give it to the kids or whether she's just going to leave it in trust. As long as Frank has taken some of his assets and put them into a trust, either ahead of time through an, a, revo an, a revocable, at that point, revocable and amendable trust, or by owning the asset and having that in his will, then those assets are not going to be considered to have been given to Mary and therefore will not be part of Mary's estate when she dies. And so, for example, using that example, say that Frank decides that he's going to take the house worth $400,000 and he's going to, instead of just giving that to Mary when he dies, he's going to put it in a trust, into this, this tax avoidance trust. So he dies, he says the house is going to go into this trust. Now remember, Mary's the trustee for the benefit of herself and the kids, right? She can keep living in the house if she wants, right? She's the trustee of this, so she can decide who lives in the house, right? She can decide whether it gets sold. If it gets sold, she can decide whether she keeps the money or the kids, you know, get the money. But the point is, because it's going into this tax avoidance trust, it's considered part of Frank's estate when he dies for tax purposes. But because there's less than a million dollars in his taxable estate, there's no tax. When Mary then dies, say she dies the next day, remember the total assets were a million two. 
So minus the house, she's got $800,000 in assets, which means her assets are less than a million dollars, which means her estate has no estate tax. So now you've avoided the estate tax. So how do you do it? So, and you did it by having this trust, right, which kicks in when, which, when, when you becomes irrevocable and unamendable when you die, which holds the assets in these, this particular way. And, and so now let's do the reverse. Say that Mary took all the cash. You remember there was five, $550,000 in cash? Suppose she said, well, you know, I'm going to keep the house jointly with Frank, you know, and he's got the IRA and he's got the, uh, the uh, annuity. But I'm going to, we're going to take all the cash and we're going to put it in my name, Mary's name, either individually or as the trustee of a trust, right, which is revocable and amendable until she dies, at which point it becomes un irrevocable and unamendable. And the trust says... Frank's the trustee for the benefit of himself and the kids, right? So she dies. So Mary's taxable estate, because it went into the tax avoidance trust, is $550,000, below a million, no tax. Frank has total control of these assets. He's the trustee. He can use them when he wants. He would, if, he, if he takes them all into his own name and then dies, they're going to be part of his estate, though. So he probably wants to leave these there and use his other assets to live on, right? So, but then when Frank dies, if he still got the rest of the assets, remember 550 and 650 goes back to that million too. If he still has that 650 in trust, there's no tax on his estate because it's less than a million dollars. See how that game gets played? I hate to call it a game, but this is, you know, you've heard this. Before people were worried about nursing homes, they were worried about this, and this was the way to deal with it, okay? So, now we got Frank and Mary, and we're back to $800,000, right? Except now, they're 85. They're not 65. So now they're worried. They're a little bit worried. What happens if Mary goes into the nursing home? What am I going to do? How am I going to spend a lot of money here? What, you know, what happens? And is there something that we can do? Don't I need a trust? Don't I really need a trust? Um, and inevitably, what they'll tell me is, I was told I have, to take, I have to transfer my assets into an irrevocable trust and wait five years. And that's the only way I can protect the assets. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And that's what we're going to talk about now, as long as you're married and you're both alive. Now, some of you who have been here before have heard this before, so you, this is your refresher course, okay? <clears throat> this is Mass Health 101. So if Mary needs nursing home care, and they've got the assets that I showed you, um, Mary can qualify for Mass Health, but only if she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. Um, the home is not countable but it is leaned if she qualifies for Mass Health. So she's, once, she's, once she has nothing but the home and she spent down all of her money, she can qualify for Mass Health, but Mass Health will then put a lien on the house in order to get repaid following her death. So that's if it's just Mary. However, if Frank is still around, Frank uh, can own the home. If she transfers it to him, he can own the home. As long as he, if it's his residence, as long as it has an equity of less than eight hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars, and if the equity, by the way, is more than eight hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars, a not uncommon occurrence around here, um, what I typically advise people to do is at that point, that's when you want a reverse mortgage. You want to do a reverse mortgage or some kind of line of credit, so that you can pull some of the equity out of your house by turning it into cash, in order to get it under eight hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars. Because it's if it's over eight twenty-eight, you're in big trouble. Right, because then it becomes a countable asset um, and has to be sold. Right, so he can own the home as long as it has less than eight hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars in equity. Right, he can have other cash or cash equivalent assets of up to one hundred nineteen thousand two hundred twenty dollars, and most importantly, he can have infinite income. He is the spouse at home can have infinite income. Um, by the way, once Mary has qualified for Mass Health, her income in, in this, if it was Social Security or pension or whatever, will go to the nursing home and MassHealth will pay the difference between that amount and whatever the nursing home bill is, right? So the main thing is here, Frank can have infinite income. So uh, if Mary goes to the nursing home, all she has to do is transfer all of her assets to Frank. She doesn't have to have 2,000, she can get down to zero. Transfer all of her assets to Frank. Frank then takes all of the assets that would put him over that 119,220 figure. Remember, the house is worth, in this case, less than $828,000, so he doesn't have to think about that. He takes all the money that's worth more than that, and he buys an annuity, a specific kind of annuity, an annuity that, call, that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy. Um, as long as he does that, the purchase of that annuity in any amount, can be a million dollars, right, 
is a legitimate conversion from a taxable asset to a non-taxable or to a non-countable, or not from a, ta from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. And remember, Frank can have infinite income. Infinite income. So the day after Frank buys that annuity, Mary can qualify for Mass Health. Right? So in this case, Frank's actuarial life expectancy, if he's 85, is, is 5.84 years. Why do I know this? There's a magic chart. Everybody goes by the same chart. No matter how sick or well Frank is, that's his life expectancy at 85. So as long as he buys an annuity that calls for equal months, say a five-year annuity or a 60-month annuity calling for equal monthly payments over his lifetime, so that's going to be, say, he, say he's got you know, $400,000. Remember, the house is worth $400,000, so he's got another $400,000 in assets. So $400,000 divided by 60. So the payment's going to be, what, $10,000 a month? It's a large, it's a big payment, right, that he'll get over, the, over those, no, less than that, a couple thousand dollars a month um, for, the rest, for, for that period of time. But, it, but as soon as he's bought that annuity, Mary qualifies for Mass Health. You with me so far? And, and I'll, I'll just mention here, people are, people are saying, but wait a minute, what about that five-year look-back period? Right? Everybody's heard of the five-year look-back period. Five-year look-back period never applies to transfers between spouses. So Mary can give things to Frank today, and tomorrow she can qualify for Mass Health. Okay? So the problem, though, is what if Frank has died? Because remember, Frank was going to leave everything to Mary, and now Mary has got all those, and now Mary needs nursing home care, and she's got all those assets because it's not a joint house anymore, it's just hers, all the money is hers, she's got $800,000. $800, now she has a problem. She's really got a problem, right? Because she's gonna have to spend down all of that money in order to qualify for Mass Health. then she can own the house, but Mass Health is gonna put a lien on it. That is the only case where if Mary, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, I'm gonna go back to Frank for a second. So remember, we transferred everything to Frank. Mary's in the nursing home. But Frank wants to make sure that if he dies, Mary's still going to be safe. So what he does is he changes his will. Remember now, he owns all the assets. And he says, instead of leaving things to my wife, I'm going to leave things in a testamentary trust for the benefit of my wife. I'm gonna name my kids as the trustees, right? It's a testamentary trust, right? It's part of the will. As long as he does that, Whatever he dies owning is remains safe and is not countable and is not lienable, even though Mary's in the nursing home or even though she's out and later goes into the nursing home. Those assets never get counted. What he would have done with the annuity, by the way, is he would have said on his annuity when he, when, he, when he bought the annuity, he would have named his kids as the beneficiaries or he could have named the same trust for the benefit of his wife as a beneficiary. And if he did that, upon his death, all the assets would be safe. So the most common planning advice that I give to people who are concerned about nursing homes if they're still mar if they're married and both alive is to change their wills and have each will specify if I die I'm going to leave everything in trust for the benefit of my spouse and then following her death I'm going to divide it up among the kids just the way the, the things would have worked anyway once the two with well, the two spouses have died if he does that when he dies all of his assets are going to be safe okay that is a testamentary trust. And, and by virtue of it being a testamentary trust, when he dies, it becomes irrevocable and unamendable, right? Irrevocable because he's dead and unamendable because he's dead. And it can't change your will after you're dead, right? So, so the, and, so, and that ends up protecting Mary. So, Mary's options. If Frank had died and not done that, and Mary had simply inherited all the assets, Mary's only options are to get rid of these assets in some way if she wants them to not be counted by Mass Health and wait five years. There are two ways of doing that. Oops. She can simply give the assets to the kids, right? Or in the case of the house, she can transfer an interest in them and keep a life estate, right? Um, a second part, but there are some problems with that, and we've talked about that. Or she can create an irrevocable and unamendable trust. Um, and, and transfer some or all of those assets to the trustee of that trust. She can transfer the cash to them. She could transfer this remainder interest to them, but keep a life estate in the house, right? Uh, if she does that, though, she cannot have control of any of those assets, as opposed to the, remember the trust that we talked about, the, the tax 
avoidance trust where when one spouse dies, there's a trust for the benefit of the other spouse, but the spouse can be the trustee. Can't be the case here. Has to be a, a, a different, a, one, of the, one or more of the kids could do it, but she can't have any control. She can't have the ability to, 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 to govern any of these assets. Um, she can have the kids as trustees, and then she has to wait five years. That's the famous five-year look-back period rule, okay? So that is the one and only case where you, may, where, where you may be wanting to create an irrevocable and unamendable trust while you're still alive, if you're single and you want to protect these assets. Actually, there is a second one if you have a vacation home. Well, there is it's a third one. If you have a vacation home, because that vacation home, going back to the example that I had given you with Frank and Mary, remember the idea behind what Frank and Mary were doing was if one went to the nursing home, we were going to turn every, we were going to transfer the house to the other spouse, and we were going to turn everything else into cash, and then have Frank buy an annuity with the extra cash. Well, of course, if you've got a vacation home, you've got to turn the vacation home into cash, and then have Frank buy the, the annuity with the extra cash. So if you don't want to do that, even if you're both still alive and you're married, that's a case where you want to transfer the property into an irrevocable trust. But if you're on Nantucket, and so you, and your house is so much over $828,000 that you don't think that even with a reverse mortgage or with an equity loan or whatever, in the case that Mary went to the nursing home, you could pull enough value out of the house to get your equity down below $828,000. In that case, even in Nantucket, you may be wanting to look at an irrevocable trust and transferring the house into an irrevocable trust. Because otherwise, if Mary goes to the nursing home and Frank's living in a house that's worth more than $828,000, that house becomes a countable asset, right? And under their rules, all the countable assets, you don't, you, you don't, you don't, they won't disqualify Mary, but, they will, but it will be required that the house gets sold, right? So you need to be thinking about that. If you're here and if you can't figure out a way to be getting that, the, not the value of the house, but the equity down below $828,000, okay? Uh, finally, going back to the Frank and Mary example, so what about, can you do this, can you do this asset protection for the benefit of the spouse while at the same time saving your, um, or causing that same tax savings, the estate tax savings? The answer to that is yes, but you've got to do one, a couple of little things differently. Uh, remember in the old example, Frank was going to die, Frank's taxable estate was going to be $400,000, right? not taxable, Mary was going to inherit the rest, and then upon her death, right, it was lower than a million, so it was tax-free. But the problem with this is that that $800,000, if Mary inherits it and then goes to the nursing home, is going to have to get spent down. That's all countable money. So the question is, can we deal with that? And the answer is yes. Um, what we can do is we can create what, we'll, what, for want of a better term, we'll call the marital trust. And many of you may have heard of that term, the marital trust. We can use that device. We can create a trust for Mary, right, with that cash. And the, there are only two things about that trust that need to be different from the trust that I talked about before, which was the, t the tax avoidance trust. Mary can't be the trustee in this case. Kids would have to be the trustees or somebody else. Um, and... Um, the, the $800,000 would need to get dropped into that trust, and any income coming from that trust in the event that she qualified for Mass Health would have to go to the nursing home. But the $800,000 would remain safe. So we would do a marital trust. The kids can still be the beneficiaries as well as Mary. The $800,000 can be dropped in. The income would have to be paid to the nursing home if Mary went to the nursing home. Um, um, but otherwise, the principal of the trust would remain safe. So. In summary, there are three kinds of reasons why you may think about trusts or having them. You may need them or you may not. Probate avoidance, estate tax minimization, asset protection from nursing homes, right? Or some combination of these. You can't do all three of these at the same time. Um, the reason for that is because of the way the Medicaid law is written. The Medicaid law, the, 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 the asset protection trust that I described that you can put into your will to protect assets for the benefit of your spouse has to be in your will. It has to be, part of, it has to be a testamentary trust because that's what the federal law says. There have been many lawyers across the country who have tried to, figure, tried to figure out how to not do it that way so that you could avoid probate while at the same time protecting the assets, and they've all failed. 
So you can't, you can do probate avoidance and estate tax minimization at the same time. You can do asset protection or you can, and estate tax minimization at the same time, but you can't do them all three. Okay? So that's a, a lot of stuff about trusts. If you've got just dying to see this again, because I went to, was talking too fast, Frank and Mary have their own uh, uh, YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. You can go see this show again, or if anybody else asks you about it, or if your neighbor says, you know, you really need a trust, right? <laughs> well, tell them to go watch the show and then decide whether they really needed a trust in the first place. Uh, and this is the goal. The goal of all the work I do is to help people sleep well at night. Any questions? Any questions? I know we covered a lot of stuff. Yes, sir? Uh, if you've got an irrevocable trust, yeah. and you and, uh, you are the trustee, and you get a reverse mortgage for the repairs of the house. If the house is in an irre is it an irrevocable trust, can you get a reverse mortgage? No. Even if there's power of appointment in the trust? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, well, and, and this isn't a, the, this, I should never say no. None of the companies that I know that do reverse mortgages will allow a reverse mortgage uh, if the property is in, is in an irrevocable trust. Even if the, the older person kept a life estate in the property, if the property were conveyed to the trustee of an irrevocable trust, right, they won't do the reverse mortgage. Uh, that's actually one of the advantages of, of doing it, of just giving the, the remainder interest to your kids but keeping a, a, a life estate in the property is that in that case, the reverse mortgage companies will do that reverse mortgage, as long as all the kids sign on the mortgage. But it's been my experience. I, should, no, this is not, I can't say that that's a law. It's been my experience with reverse mortgage companies that they won't do that deal. Okay? You may find one. If you do, let me know. <laughs> let me know. Other questions? Yes, sir. When you say co-owned assets, mm -hmm. like say an IRA. Can't uh, be a co-owned asset. IRAs well, are always owned. She's listed as, as uh, a beneficiary. In my SEP IRA. She's listed as a beneficiary, but that's not considered a co-owned no. asset. That's in my name. That's right, but it's an ah, but it, but see, but that's the point about those assets is that technically you don't own them. The asset is owned by the custodian who is taking care of that money for you, and theref theref therefore, upon your death, never goes through probate as long as you've named a death beneficiary. It's like a life insurance policy. Life insurance policy. You don't own the money in the life insurance policy. Well, the insurance company does, but, you have, but your contract says you have the right to order them to pay somebody if you're dead, right? Same thing with the IRA, right? So as long as it's in the IRA and as long as you've named a death beneficiary and she's still alive, if she dies, do something, right? I had that problem. I had a, I had a couple that, that, that divorced and the wife got rid of the husband as the, as the beneficiary, obviously, but forgot to name anybody else and then she dropped dead on the train, actually, worked at State Street Bank, walked, dropped dead in the train, and so now all those assets became um, uh, probate assets, had to, and her father was still alive uh, and had dementia. This is one of those classic, you know, and so all the money ended up going to a nursing home in, in Washington State <laughs> because he couldn't qualify for mm -hmm. Medicaid because he inherited all this money because she hadn't changed her death beneficiary. That's a long answer to a short question. Is that helpful? Uh, yes, ma'am, and then you, sir. Yes, ma'am. As far as taxation goes, right. like all pay, pay all, all POD accounts are, are, in, are part of your taxable estate, even though they are not part of your probate estate because you, it was a POD account, so we know who's going to own it when you die. Actually, I have a problem resulting from that right now because I just got a case. A woman died um, and left her condo to her son. All of her other accounts were in POD accounts, right? Condos worth... 400,000. The POD accounts were worth 800,000 actually. Totals a million too. So there's going to be a tax. And the statute says that the, that the, that the um, personal representative has to pay the tax because the house is going to have to go through probate. Right? So the probate's going to, so the, 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 the tax is going to get paid by the estate. But the estate only has the condo. So effectively, the, the child who, is, who inherited the condo is going to be paying all of the tax. Mm -hmm. And that child has the right to assert contribute, to, to sue the others to get contribution for that tax. But good luck, you know, because the tax divided among the other nine people is only, you know, five or $10,000 a person or whatever. But anyway, that, so if it's a POD account, 
It's not part of the probate estate, but it's definitely part of the taxable estate because you control any asset you control, including life insurance, right? Life insurance proceeds, unless you've done some special things, put them in an irrevocable life insurance trust, different kind of trust, um, are all part of your taxable estate. Other questions? I'm sorry, I had a, yes, sir. The question is, the question is, what if, what if you relocate to another state? Um, that's going to depend. On, <laughs> that sounds like a lawyer answer. That's going to depend on the laws of that state, right? As to real estate that you leave behind, right? That Massachusetts trust is going to remain valid. It's gonna, it needs to be a Massachusetts trust, right? As to the cash that you bring with you, right? Chances are that trust is still going to be valid in that state, but 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 whether it is or not is a matter of that state's law. So you're going to want to go talk to a lawyer there to find that out. Is there a trust that's universal throughout the country? Is there a universal trust? No. Sorry about that. Just because legislatures have the ability to, to, to change those rules. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a revocable trust. Yeah. I'm widowed. Yeah. Um, my only worry is to save my property from the island home. Should I put that in an irrevocable? That's exactly the So the question is, you're, that, that's the classic case. That's right. You're widowed. You have a revocable trust, which you did for a state avoidance or for probate avoidance purposes, probably maybe a number of years ago, right? But now the issue is, what if you need to qualify for mass health? And the answer is, if you, are, if you have two possibilities. You can either, you have three. You can transfer the property to somebody, keep a life estate, transfer it to your kids or whatever or transfer it to an irrevocable trust and also you know, keep an interest in the property, right? And the reason why you want to keep that interest in the property, by the way, is to make sure that when you die, the tax basis in the property jumps to the date of death value. Um, you don't want to end up in a situation where you give your kids the property with your tax basis, especially if, you've owned, if, if you're in Nantucket and you've owned the house for a long time. Um, but so, so that's, that's, that's another, the third possibility is you can get remarried. Nobody ever takes that one. <laughs> I've suggested that to so many people. I say, you know, just find somebody, you know, anybody. I don't care. It could be a long distance. They'll probably pay you for it. You know, somebody, you know, some lucky Ukrainian, you know, will just be delighted to marry you. Right? Okay. Is that, just, is that a proposal? That's, <laughs> how much is that house worth? <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Any other questions? By the way, I'm just going to, I'm going to mention one other thing. By the way, speaking of this, of this tax issue. So the next presentation I'm going to be doing I'm going to be talking about um, the, the kind of the, the, the conflicts between what your goals may be in terms of trying to have an estate tax or a plan that avoids estate tax versus a plan that protects your house in terms of mass health versus a plan that avoids the income tax, right? And, I want, and, and I'm going to talk about that for a while. I'm just going to mention this now because I, I know from having dealt with quite a few people now in Nantucket that a lot of people... Um, especially if they've had the property for quite a while, um, you, um, put their properties in so-called QPRTs, Q -P -R -Ts, Qualified Personal Residence Trusts. These were very popular. They're still legal. Um, and the purpose of them was to try to make sure that you avoided having your home be in your estate for estate tax purposes. And the way this game worked was that you would have a, a trust that you would transfer the property to, and then you would basically lease the house from the trust for a period of time, during which time you would slowly give the value in the property away to your children. And the goal was that the property, if you died, would not be part of your estate for estate tax purposes. And that was really important back when the minimum estate subject to, to federal estate taxation was a million dollars. Because the, because once you were, once you're in the estate tax, the federal system, the rates are tremendously high. I mean, the rates Run, a, run way, well over 50%. They started like 30 something percent. So they're big taxes, right? But of course, th th that has become pretty much an irrelevancy now because the, the, the minimum subject to taxation has become so high. So the amount that you save by simply avoiding the Massachusetts estate tax is really very small. Once you get past that first million three, as I mentioned to you, the initial rate after a million hundred twenty thousand dollars is like 6% or 7%. The reason why that's of significance is that, I mean, the good news when you did the Cupert was that effectively you got the, you basically gifted your house to your children and therefore it wasn't part of your estate, right? 
The bad news is when you make a gift of appreciated property, property that you bought for a lower amount that is now worth more, that you're giving that person your basis in the property, right? So if you bought your house 20 years ago here for, I'll give an example from Syascon, a small place in Syascons for you know $200,000, and it's now worth 2.1 million, right? And you put it in a cupert, right? When you die, your kids are going to have a basis in that property of the $200,000. And when they sell for $2.1 million, they're going to pay a capital gains tax on the difference. And that's a big number. And that's way more, a number that's way more than what they would be paying in estate tax if the property were still in your name when you died. You'll pay an estate tax, but the basis, the, the magic about, about, the, 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 about when you die for capital gains purposes is the basis of the property jumps to the date of death value. So the kids in that case pay, sell the house and, and, and they sell it capital gains free. So if you think that your kids are going to need to sell your house after you die, you do not, you, and you bought it a long time ago, you do not want it in a Cooper. You want to be able to pick up this step up. But we're going to talk about that more next time. So anyway, that was today. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you in a couple months. Thank you.